Welcome to Inspire Me with Jay. This is a podcast to inspire, uplift, show forth the love of God, and help usher in the spiritual awakening. Please like, subscribe to this channel, and share everywhere. Thank you. Welcome to Inspire Me with Jay. I have a special guest today, Ryan Bear. How are you, Ryan? Uh, excellent. Thank you. A great day at work, and the weather here uh, where I'm at is warm and amazing. So, yeah, the day is great. So where where are you located? Uh, Colum- basically Columbus, Ohio, just north of Columbus. Um, right now I'm in Westerville, a suburb of Columbus. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? What do you do? Um, that's a good starting question. I, I am uh, my day job. I'm a project manager, and um, on my free time, I, I dedicate myself to health and self improvement, um, and then also trying to grow. Um, I guess maybe my brand and more awareness around um, mental and emotional health. And um, I have a background that, that sets me up um, for this. And uh, I have a blog currently that I, I uh, constantly expanding. And I have a, um, a good friend photographer that um, helps me out with that. So um, I know that there's a lot of people out there that push um, mental health and emotional health. Uh, I'm trying to do it creatively. Um, so I have a lot of plans to keep the message going. Um, but, yeah, I do have a unique background um, with trauma and abuse and having to unlearn behaviors that were taught to me that weren't good. Um, and so it's kind of a dedication of that field and, and studying other professors and, and other people that have gone through trauma and abuse. And um, I like to learn from others and uh, um, borrow the good um, parts from others, good parts of speakers, good parts of, of motivated people. Um, David Goggins is a name that I like to bring up when it comes to borrowing things from people. I don't know if you're familiar with David Goggins, but he has a heck of a story. Um, so my whole approach is it's not just about me and what I've been through. It's about what other people have been through. It's about the fact that many people can share and relate to a lot of things that can impact negatively and positively your mental health. Um, and I think part of my urgency is that if you open your eyes, there's a huge decline in society over the several years. And so that's kind of my direction. Kind of a long answer. I tried to incorporate a lot of things. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And then you can, you can ask from there what, what, what part you want to get into. So do you think we're starting to hear a lot more about mental health on TV and in the media and, and things like that. Do you think COVID contributed a lot to it with the isolation that people had to endure? Yeah, you know, I find that interesting because at that time of COVID, I, I so I, I went on this process of fixing myself and during COVID, I was basically, I had already proven to myself by that time that, that I'm good. And I was working on my next stage of wanting to get into blog and wanting to get into social media and actually come out of, because I, I had stepped away from social media for a long time. So the interesting thing about COVID is everybody was locked down and, and those changes were made, but I had already locked myself down. So it didn't personally affect me too much. I already had a routine of writing, a routine of exercise, a routine of um, cutting back on going out and hitting fast food or going out and hitting the bars. Um, I cut back on a lot of things. I was already 
locking myself down. So it didn't affect me, but I saw all the reports. I've seen domestic violence raised during COVID. Um, I, so many things we could probably get into. There's so many reports. So to answer your question, yes, seems like it impacted a lot of people. And I also think there's a lot of people that use it for an excuse. Both of those are would, would be related to mental and emotional health because you shouldn't use it as an excuse. But the one thing that um, I actually talk about the COVID on my blog, uh, if you if you can identify life and and what you want out of it and what it, how you can get out of it, um, things like pandemics shouldn't affect you. If you're on point with yourself, if you're on point with your own humanity, if you if you keep company with good people, healthy people, and not people that drain you or abuse you, um, those things shouldn't shouldn't bother you. Um, the people that are impacted the most are the people that aren't grounded. Um, maybe they don't have a good plan. Maybe all they do is, is go out to the bars or something. But, um, yeah, I think COVID had an impact. Did you suffer from um, depression yourself or PTSD, anxiety? What, what kind of issues Not did you have in terms of... Struggle with mental. Uh, so I was raised in a toxic family, and this is the, the parts that I can relate to the most. Uh, mom and dad were not, um, they had, they were, they never healed from their trauma. So I, I guess I'll start off by saying, because I have learned about my family tree, it's generational trauma that has been passed down. Um, similar to the stories you hear if there's an alcoholic father and then maybe the son grows up to be alcoholic. Now, my dad didn't have alcohol issues that I know of. Um, it wasn't, I wouldn't call him a drunk father, but he displayed narcissism. The, uh, specifically, he displayed grandiose style of narcissistic personality disorder. And when you get into those kinds of things, you, you learn that a lot of those people were developed from abuse. And when you, when I learned the stories and whatnot, my mom and dad, um, like I said, never recovered from their abuse. And, and there was abuse from, to their parents, um, and it was generational. And the other key point to this is I'm the oldest of two other siblings. And I saw the impact of the narcissism, the neglect, and the various abuse. Um, not only to myself, but to my younger siblings. Then I watched them grow into adulthood and, and have kids of their own. I don't have any kids and saw some issues there. Now, I will say that I'm not going to go into too much detail about my siblings because I respect of privacy, but the impact is real when it comes to generational abuse, when it comes to... Um, role models with parents so I, I can speak quite a bit about that and the importance of parents needing to role model behaviors and so i'm a huge advocate of early childhood development one of the questions just because we're talking about this that i like to point out to society and point out in my my social media blogs and in my posts is who teaches people to be parents and if you deep dive into that question um, parenthood is taken for granted and I don't think it's necessarily uh, it's a scary opportunity is what I'll say because we have licenses and certificates for almost everything when it comes to driving or skilled labor of any kind but there is no license or certificates for being a parent and that's argu arguably the most important role in humanity and I, I always bring it back to that because everything is about people. And if everything's about people, we should care about humanity. And another thing I like to bring up is if you want people to care about you, then you should care about people as well. So it's it's an even um, an, an even 
ground there and and it can get so deep there are so many things that can affect mental health which is why it's crucial to start with a good foundation with a good strong family that can role model healthy behavior so because of the neglect and various abuse that i was raised into and if you want to hear specifics um, about what happened to me i could probably share some there it led me into a wild years in my teens where I'm doing things I shouldn't, shouldn't do. Um, I've been through depression. Um, I've been through almost a lot of the emotions that people struggle with. I, I went through a few years where I was drinking way too much, almost daily. Um, I was on cigarettes, uh, but I broke from all of that in, in a refocused my mindset on healthy things. I've done nothing but work out the last several years, um, improved my diets, improved my sleep. Um, and then not only that, but I have improved my skills as a leader and in my, uh, you know, employment. That's why I'm a project manager now and excelling at that. Um, but yes, I, I had to change and unlearn and figure out why those things were happening to me. And it's a long process. And that's part of, I share a lot in my blog actually of my hard times and, and what I had to go through to change. What kind of a, uh, abuse or neglect did you have to go through? Uh, so from a very young age, uh, my father seemed to like the, tease me so there was different episodes so i'll share some different things um i my earliest memories is my dad smoking pot in front of me with a bong and um um my mom got him to stop at some point because i was about four i believe and I started to try to make my own bong. That's how much my dad was doing it in front of me. And as a child, as a boy, I should say, you look up to your father, you want to understand your father. So I'm doing, I'm mimicking what I see around me and I'm trying to make a bong. Um, my parents would, they were kind of partying. I guess I should let you know, they had me when they were 17 and 18. So they were young and not really developed. They just ran away from home. My dad ran away from home. And, and like I said, they struggled with their development. So it's generational. And this is quite common. Um, people that are abused in trauma are more likely to get pregnant early. So everything that I will share here is almost textbook when you study it, when it comes to early childhood development and abuse and different things. Um, uh, one night, uh, my dad was making macaroni and cheese, and he was boiling water. And I don't know the specifics of what happened, but the story has changed many times. Basically, he spilt boiling water on my stomach, and for and it, for whatever reason, well, I think I know the reason. They didn't want to get in trouble. Um, I was not taken to the hospital right away, um, but uh, my parents told me I was screaming and, and crying, which, of course, it's boiling hot water on your stomach. Um, now, this is where the story has changed a couple of times, and I'm trying to get information from the state, but it was so long ago. This was in the late 70s. Um, I think it was around 76 seven or 78. So the records are kind of tough trying to um, go back. I do remember being fooled by the state. So what had happened is they didn't take me to the hospital until the next morning. So it was either after they sobered up or something. And um, of course the hospital questioned them on it. And based on whatever answers they gave, the state investigated it, and I was removed from my home. They actually came and took me from my home, um, and I think I was gone a couple of months. I don't remember the how long exactly, but I do remember the car ride to the with the strange man in the business suit 
going to the state of Ohio, and then they had me um, locked away and where at children's services or whatever it is, whatever the state building is. But after a couple of months, they uh, somehow my parents were able to get custody of me again. So I went back to my parents. But so that's one incident. Um, but if we would go swimming, uh, my dad would like to throw me in the water and, and uh, make me. I would not want to be thrown in and go under, but he would tease me and, and be kind of ornery with me. Um, a number of of different little incidents that weren't right. Um, he, he raged a lot. He yelled a lot. He would spank me with a <clears> two by four, which there's nothing wrong with spanking if it's done right. This so something that I learned about childhood punishment is that um, it has to make sense. The child has to understand, and similar to police work, the punishment kind of has to fit the the wrongdoing or whatever you want to call it. I think my dad would spank me for things that you shouldn't spank a child for. And that causes problems. So as I share about that kind of stuff, it, I do, I will share one moment that my sister admitted to me once. And in part of her issues was she, she remembers our dad raging at her and, and she has no clue why. And I bring that up because I've learned that from Jordan Peterson and other psychologists, um, how crucial it is that your kids understand what you're doing. And if you're raging at your kid on something and, and they don't understand why, um, that's how things can, can get messed up in your head. And if it's repeated day <clears throat> after day, week after week, month after month, that's actually how you can develop some PTSD. So I don't know if a lot of people realize this um but i know a lot of people have been abused and a lot of people don't even know they've been <clears throat> abused. and it doesn't even have to be physical abuse; it could be emotional abuse. and over time the emotional bruise it can wear on you the gaslighting um just there's so many different ways to be abused and, and it again that's why i blog because it's a really complicated topic but um uh, my dad would use me uh, to reload his ammo. I would spend hours on end as a young kid relo uh, reloading his ammunition for his guns and, and cleaning stuff out. Um, he, I quite often felt like his slave. Um, he didn't really ever engage with me the way he needed to. Now, there are some positives that that were there, like he taught me how to ride a bike and some things. There were moments that were positive, but all in all, it wasn't good. Um, there was, he'd misfired his gun once and it shot a bullet upstairs. Um, it didn't hit me, but just the fact that it could have, um, that was kind of an issue. Um, the, uh, the one thing that bothered me is when I got into middle school, <clears throat> he taught me how to play the game of chess. And I was pretty good. By the time I got to middle school, I was really good in chess. And I want to say actually just before middle school, right around fifth grade, <laughs> he stopped playing with me because I started beating him. He would flip the board, um, yell, scream. Um, and all he I should mention, uh, most of the past time, if he wasn't at work, he was sitting in a chair watching TV. So if I wanted to engage with him, I had to come down with him and in, into the TV. If I wanted to play chess or any kind of game with him, I had to set it up so he can watch TV at the same time. Um, so the reason why I brought up middle school and chess is that uh, the middle school I went to actually had a chess class. And so I started to schedule chess at middle school to play other people because my dad would stop playing. <clears throat> um, another thing that affected me, I think, was actually back up before middle school. I was in probably third, fourth grade, and I would have to hold the rabbit ears antenna. If you remember before cable TV and you just had the rabbit ears, you could get the fuzzy not a clear signal, but
but if you touch it with your hands because of you know the what what goes through our body you can get a, a better signal so for saturdays and sundays i would uh hold the antenna so he could get a better reception on his westerns um now he would give me breaks on commercials i, I could relax sit down go get something to drink but when his show comes back on i got to get back there and hold the antenna so he can watch it so it's just a whole host of things and a lot of that stuff i do talk about and some other things I talk about on the blog, but when I say mental and emotional abuse um, and role modeling behaviors, that's all important from the caregivers. And for whatever reason, my mom and dad had, um, they, they tried to make it work, they did end up splitting. But my mom would work third shift, my dad would work first shift, and that caused a strain and, and they just didn't act like a loving couple. And fast forward through time, my dad would come out and say that he never loved my mom. So if that, and you can see it when we're being raised. So um, I don't think it's good for parent, for kids to be raised with parents that don't love each other or don't know how to express love. That again, plays with the mentality. Um, so there's a lot of things there that uh, impacted me and it makes sense on why I struggled through high school and struggled after high school on what to do with my life and where to put my focus. Um, and it never, I couldn't really start to make sense of things until about my mid thirties, I decided enough is enough and I need to start focusing on myself. And it was about my mid thirties that I started to deep dive in psychology deep dive on self-reflection and started to make changes in my 30s and then when I got into my 40s and by the time COVID came around um, <clears throat> that's why I'm saying I was ready I, it didn't bother me because I refocused my whole life I, I, mm -hmm. I look at it like what's the next challenge um, you have to know that nobody's perfect you have to know that you're not going to be perfect so in the process of fixing yourself, you have to try to give other people the chance and you have to understand that other people aren't going to be perfect. So it, once I started to get myself to a certain level, then I realized I needed to start working on my, my socialness again. I had, to, I had to give up all my old friends. That, that was part of my, my change was that I noticed a lot of people, all they want to do is go to the bar. All they wanted to do is drink. All they want to do is watch TV. All they want to do is make fun of other people, whatever it is. And so as I started to make my changes in my 30s, I realized that a lot of people that I was around, it just it couldn't work. I can't be me. You find yourself being two different people just to please others. I spent several years of my life stressed, anxious, and depressed. I needed to find something that would make my life work. For me, that was meditation. With meditation, I found the peace of mind that I was looking for. I found the happiness. And I found a way to improve every area of my life. My emotional life, my spiritual life, my relationships. I was able to discover things about myself. I can give you the tools to meditate. I will walk you through the process and hold your hand. Whether you're a beginner to meditation who's never meditated, or whether you're someone who's tried meditation and it just never seemed to work, we can make it work. Meditation is something that everyone can do and I can show you how. Check out my course on meditation. What are some of the things you did to help fix yourself? Because you you talked about some of them with me. Because um, you you did several different things to change your life. Like, what are some I of the steps you took to get better mental health? Sure. Um... I went through a phase of 
working on my mindset. And, and so that's when I say I, I started to study professionals because you can, with the internet, you can, there's a lot of free um, lectures. Uh, there's a, uh, his, his name skips my mind, but there's a guy from Stanford that's really good. His name starts with an S. Um, I mentioned Jordan Peter Peterson. There's Dr. Romani. There's a lot of good information out there, but it's not just the professionals I wanted to listen to. I want to listen to uh, other people like the David Goggins I mentioned, and, and there's a whole host of others. I got links on my YouTube channel. But learn from other people that struggle. Something that I learned is is we're, we can learn from each other. So um, I did a lot of that to, to just get different perspectives. Uh, and then the more that I did that, the more I stopped wanting to watch TV shows. So one of my changes was to cut out, because I, I, I used to collect movies, I used to watch movies, I used to watch all kinds of TV shows. But part of that was because everybody I knew around, that's what they did. Well, even though, yes, there's some nice ones out there, it's nice to be entertained. Um, I full, fully believe now that you can overdo it. You can over just get lost into TV. And then when I think about my dad and how, how he spent all of his time in TV, I realized, yeah, you want to maybe work on your brain a little bit more. So I, I realized that not just your physical body, but your brain can deteriorate if you don't use it. If you don't exercise, your physical body can deteriorate. So it was changing my mindset. And then as part of that, to convince myself, because it's very hard, right? You got to stop drinking. You got to stop smoking. You got to stop doing the things you don't want to do. I, I wanted to prove to myself that I had discipline. So I slowly would do things to practice my discipline. Um, I would do push-ups every day, or if, if there was something on TV that I was watching, I would do push-ups during the commercials. Um, I did little things, and I would do them consistently to prove that I had the discipline. And I will tell you, as I was going through my 30s and into my 40s, um, I had gotten a DUI. It was actually, so I, I'll, I'll real quick, I moved away from my home state of Ohio in 2006 because I, because of my head was a mess and I, I, I had given up trying to understand my family. So I had to get away from them. So I moved away, went to Milwaukee, Wisconsin for work, uh, a whole new group of friends, a whole new start on life and that uh, I had gotten a DUI in Ohio and, and so that pushed me to my limit. So I got out, went to Milwaukee. I tried to start over there and then met a girl that it didn't go well. I, I actually blog about the ending of that. And then coming out of that is when I decided to make my big changes. Um, her and I had broken up and then I had gotten my second DUI and, and it it floored me. I didn't know. And I talk about my second DUI on my blog as well. And it wasn't because I was drinking all the time. It was one particular night that I decided to go out and then I was just careless about it. So, and because I had a job at the time where I traveled, I kept this a secret. So part of my discipline was I, I, I forced myself. I didn't share that I, I had my DUI. So job didn't know that I wasn't allowed to drive. But I, I told myself that I can't get pulled over anymore because I would lose my job. I would lose everything. So I disciplined myself with driving from that day forward. I... I because uh, I would travel and get rental cars and, and do all this kind of thing. So for like the next five, six years, um, I kept that all a secret. And then once I got through what I could get through and le get legal again for driving, get legal with my documents, have all that stuff paid for, all the fines paid for, um, that's when I got out of that mm. job that I had and I could. I felt myself getting put back together. 
I convinced myself, I worked on my discipline with exercise, with eating, with not getting in trouble, no more getting pulled over, no tickets. And um, through over several years, I, I convinced myself and proved to myself that I have the dedication, the consistency, and the discipline to do what I needed to do. And so from that, from that moment in my life, I started to find little things and I make little adjustments. So now today I do little things like I eat an apple every day. And just recently I made changes. I now eat peanut butter with my apple every day. So when I say I make little changes, I make little changes and they're typically healthier and for the better, uh, for the better. Um, so mm -hmm. I guess the short answer is it's through consistency and discipline and changing little habits and behaviors. So one thing I like to said, talk about is your progression okay. or your regression mm -hmm. is hidden in your routine. It, it's mm -hmm. what you do every day. Well, and you also mentioned that like you try to get seven to eight hours of sleep a night. So part of what made in my 30s kind of tough was the job that I had was overnight. It was an overnight job when I traveled. Um, the traveling was nice. I learned a lot from it because I traveled so much. I learned that you don't need a lot. So I ended up giving up my movie collections. I gave up my big screen TVs. I became a minimalist because I learned to find peace in myself because I was always in the hotel room. Um, so that was a, a little piece of it. Um, and I got off track there. Um, what was your comment or what was that question? Oh, we were just talking about getting enough sleep at night. The sleep. Yeah. Yes. The sleep. So working overnights was really tough cause it threw me off. And so my eating wasn't good at that time and the sleep wasn't good at that time, but I just knew I had to get through what I needed to get through. So COVID happened. Um, and I wanted to try to give my family another chance. So a couple of years ago, I came back to Ohio and I, I was ready to start a whole new life. I lost my job during COVID. I had a really good job during COVID. I lost it. And so at that time, and I all through all my changes, I wanted to come back, try to help my family, help members of my family understand what I went through, understand what it takes to get better. A lot of the things that I just mentioned to you and, and a lot of uh, other things that I blog about. And I also knew I wanted to find a good job. I knew what I can do based on the work that I've done. I know I'm basically project manager material. And um, so I started applying everywhere. And then a really great company, um, somehow I just found this great company. <laughs> Uh, things just happen to work out, not to not to get off into the weeds, but because I've disciplined myself, because of the things that I've done, and then I worked on my resume, um, this company hired me. And so here I am with no degree in project management, but I'm a project manager. And they, they allow me my hours through the week. Um, I'm salary, so th there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, and that helps a lot. The job that I had in my 30s and 40s with the overnight work, that was tough. It wasn't salary, and the hours were very demanding. Um, but now, with my job, it allows me to do what I want with the blog. It allows me to do what I want with my free time. It doesn't take away from my health. It doesn't take away from my sleep. So getting back to that sleep part, I have my life on a schedule that works for me. And because we're talking about that, there's three things that I taught myself. And I think this came from Jordan Peterson, if I'm not mistaken. But there's three things <clears throat> for someone to be successful. Have a schedule and stick to it. So that's where the sleeping comes in and the eating habits. Um, do not suppress anything. I think you learn in most psychology classes one-on-one -on -one, that suppressing emotion, especially deep ones, can really mess with you. Um, and the third one, <laughs> uh, it's escaping me at the moment, but uh, have a schedule, stick to it, 
Don't suppress emotions. Eh, it's on my blog. It's it's blanking me. I haven't thought about it in a second. But there's a lot of those little things that I stick to and live by, and they become and over time they become ingrained in your habits. They they become ingrained. So it's been so long since I brought up those three key things that verbally I forget that third one, but they're ingrained in my routine. They're ingrained in my everyday. Mm -hmm. So do you, you said that you do meditation too. Is that part of your I, keeping good mental health? <clears throat> I Let me be clear. I'm learning about that. Um, I, I, I've, I've been learning more on meditation. I've been learning more about how different people meditate and the different styles. Um, and from what I've learned, I think I've kind of developed my own style. That's, I don't know if it's going to be quite accurate. Um, I don't know if I'm ready to describe it, but I think it has to do with when I listen to music. So a big part of this is, is my life. And because I never really had anyone consistent throughout my life, I developed a relationship with music. And I realized over time that my relationship with music is a little bit different than a lot of people. Yes, a lot of people can jam. A lot of people can bob their head. A lot of people know a beat. But uh, I think it gets inside me a little bit different. And anytime... I, I can literally listen to music to anything. It'll make me work better. It'll make me do anything better. And um, I've narrowed my playlist down, so it's not just any kind of music. It, it's 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 upbeat music. It's motivational music. It's it's lyrics. So I pick and choose. Um, I've thought about getting a playlist of music, but the thoughts and what I think about and the troubles that I've gone through. Uh, <clears throat> I use music to kind of help me with that. But that's where I'm trying to learn about the different meditation styles. And I'm not exactly ready to, to, to pinpoint it yet. But one of the things that I read recently, there's a couple of things that I do with music that seems to be similar to what you get out of meditation. And that's where I was drawing the connection to. Mm -hmm. Well, like when you do uh, meditation with music, do you have a particular type of music that you get meditative in? Kind of. So it can be kind of a complicated answer. Um, one thing I will say about my relationship with music is that it expands so many genres. I've noticed that the more expansive your genres of music I, there's something to that if all you did was listen to one style say heavy metal say rap mm -hmm. say pop i think you're limited if you open up and listen to indie artists listen to um alternative and and it's and i almost don't like to label it but it has to, it's, it's the creation it's the piece um it's and i think it's going to be unique to the individual so i could sit there and make a list of songs and explain why they mean so much to me and why they work for me but i i can't sit there and say they're going to work for you or anybody else it's it's what it does to me and it it's what i think about when it's in my head or it's what I don't think about it clears it and, and sometimes it's the beat so there's there's different types of music where there's no lyrics it's the way the beat hits it's the way the drum hits it's the way the instruments hit but if you can think of just zoning out or just getting lost into the rhythm of something and I, I find it works much better when I put on um, I have a noise canceling headphones so something that's where you can feel lost in it. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done like um, meditation music specifically, ambient, new age? Like if you go to YouTube and type those terms in, you know, you you'll get like a certain type of music that's usually instrumental, very mellow, 
things like so that. So I'll fall asleep to that stuff sometimes. I, I actually have, I, I will find ambient stuff and I will go to sleep and I, it, I sleep better. Um, I don't do it every night and sometimes I'll do it for a week straight, mm -hmm. but then sometimes I'll go a week and not do it, but I do do it. And I, I will tell you, I just went three weeks of listening to Gregorian chant going to sleep. And that was amazing. Um, there's, uh, something I've been doing recently is Indian flute. Um, but yes, there's all kinds of different styles of ambient music and, and, and it might be hard when I think back of myself, I didn't necessarily like all kinds of music. It's grown over time. The beats grow over time. My appreciation and my expansion grows over time. So. Uh, I just want to throw it out there because I have had people ask me about music and stuff like that. and Don't think that maybe something doesn't. There's a lot of music that the first time I hear it, it, I don't really feel it. But then when I hear it again, I feel it. And then sometimes there's music where I feel it instantly right away. So, um, again, I think that's an individual thing probably, and it probably depends on the person. But. For me, I I can I, it's a pretty big uh, it's a big broad range of music. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a certain meditation time that you do it, and like for how long? Or so when I work out, I know that's my music time. Um, part of that, what those three things I told you earlier, have a schedule and stick to it. Um, so if something upsets me during the day. I'm to the point where I can control myself in the moment and depending on what it is, ah, I'll use that later when I'm working out because sometimes we need a release. So when we talk about emotional health and we talk about being emotionally healthy and, and, and um, it's not always about ignoring and, and, we, and I, I talked about this, we don't want to suppress so sometimes, you know, we're human. Sometimes there are times where we need to let aggression out. Well, that's where working out helps me. And I do have different playlists. I'll have an angry playlist, you know, if I need to get a lot of energy out and I want a really hard workout. But I also have mellow playlists and just motivating playlists. Um, but so... When I set time for music, that's kind of one of my things that I've done is it, is I'll attach it to my workout. So I attach music to my workouts, which is almost it, it, they're basically every other day. Sometimes I'll do sometimes I'll change it up, but basically it's every other day and I'll attach different kinds of music at my sleep sometimes, not every night. And then when I drive in the car. So when I incorporate music in my life, it's almost always in the car, almost always when I'm working out, and then occasionally when I go to sleep. So when I think about it, that's a lot of music, but yes. Mm -hmm. So where can people find your blog, and how can they reach out to you if they want to reach out to you? Uh, great. Um, www.walkawayruntowards.com. And uh, I don't know if you can see, but I, I have tattoos on my arm that uh, mm -hmm. it's run towards on my forearm. And I show that on my channel and on the inside of my forearms, it's walk away. And that hall that represents walking away from toxicity and running towards balance, goals, dreams. Um, and I, I'm trying to expand. So on my blog, I have information on Facebook, how you can get a hold of me. You can reply on my blog. I actually want to encourage other people to share their stories because, again, I don't – what I struggled with coming out with this and being social is I'm not trying to make it about what I went through and, and oh, woe is me. It's about self-development. It's about we can all share. We all have stories that can be woe is me. We all, some of us may be worse than others, but it's about getting better. It's not about being perfect. So mm -hmm. uh, the blog, www.walkawayruntowards.com, 
and my YouTube channel is Whiskey Juice. Um, the whiskey represents we're not perfect. Uh, I, I don't even I don't even know the last time I had whiskey, but I will drink a whiskey once in a while, usually during the football season. But that's what the whiskey represents, and the juice represents the zest for life, the zest for trying and getting better. Um, so uh, part of the other reason why I, I use whiskey juice is uh, that was just an old handle that I used, so I kept it. So whiskey juice the channel www.walkawayruntowards.com is the blog, and uh, actually hoping to maybe do a podcast of my own at some point. So this is really great that you had me on, so I can kind of get a feel for it from this side. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on today. It was a pleasure to have you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jay. Have you ever wondered whether the Bible was compatible with the near-death experience? In my book, Heaven's Truth, The Parallels Between the Bible and the Near-Death Experience, your faith will be strengthened while you support this channel. In Heaven's Truth, you will learn about near-death experiences and other similar experiences in the Bible. Support for the Bible contained in NDEs. A central theme that runs through both the Bible and NDEs. How the NDE brings the Bible to life for these modern times. Evidence for both the Bible and the NDE. And much more. Great book. Spillers does an excellent job weaving the relationship between NDEs and the scriptures. Five stars on Amazon. Available on Amazon.